Good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, just one announcement. Michael Graves, who actually is a very close friend of Alberto's, is going to give a talk on the 16th of December in this very room as part of Bill's Design Talks. So I hope you can come for that. But I have to tell you that I was just down in Philadelphia on Saturday um, where um, Alberto Alessi has his wonderful exhibition at the Museum of uh, Art down there. And uh, in the uh, little preview that he gave when he was walking people around the, uh, the gallery, here comes Michael Graves on his, uh, in his wheelchair and has it stand up and they have a lovely conversation together. You can see it on my blog. Um, so um, that was a wonderful moment. We are so thrilled that he's also found time in his long US, you know, Wisconsin and Philadelphia to stop here for us this evening. Um, and I think the best thing for me to do is just to ask him to speak to you. But I do want to say that I think Alberto Alessi and the whole Alessi family are really unique in our design world in that they managed to make a, a, a successful business that also allows so many designers to experiment with the edge of art, art and the unexpected and experiment. Um, so it's really fabulous to have Alberto Alessi. Please give him a welcome. Yeah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I will start my speech right away since uh, I promised to keep it in one hour. Let's see. So my purpose tonight is to give you an idea of, uh, of, um, of a typical phenomenon of Italian design uh, culture, which is represented by the so-called Italian design factories, meaning a group of companies concentrated into the areas of uh, furniture, lighting, and accessories, objects, uh, almost all started in the right, right after war period. And Alessi being, of course, uh, one of the examples of these uh, factories. So I start with the family. Alessi is, uh, as Bill said, a family company also today. <laughs> this is the part of the company, of the, of the family working within the company. Family is actually much bigger. The place, Vallestrona. This valley is called Vallestrona, Lake Orta. is a small lake, uh, 100 kilometers to the north of Milano, very close to Switzerland. In this valley, Vallestrona uh, started uh, um, about uh, approximately 300 years ago, a tradition of production of small objects in wood and metal for the house, for the kitchen in general. You see, yeah, the valley is even today a very conservative place. Uh, some local products. <coughs> this is also a local product, a wooden Pinocchio. The valley is also today the biggest producer of wooden Pinocchios, in spite <laughs> of China. Uh, spinning, which was, uh, still is, in part, the technique for production. Uh, for both wood and metal. And my two grandfathers. To the left, to the left, Alfonso Bialetti is uh, the father of my mother. He was the inventor, the designer, and then the producer of the first Italian espresso maker in 1931. No, no. Uh, and the other grandfather, Giovanni, started the Alessi Company in 1921. Some uh, very early products during the 20s. The ball hammer, the fiasco holder of a cheese uh, tray. A new material means the, the start of the use of a stainless steel, which was uh, around in the 30s, and some early prototypes in that material. 
Then the third is uh, actually design in the sense of the meaning that we give today to that term started in Alice with my father Carlo. He was trained as an industrial designer and uh, he was the responsible of many Alessi products between 35 and 45. Here you see my father very happy and proud with his last project for Alessi, the tea and coffee set called Bombay, in production since uh, 45. After 45, beginning 50s, my father abandoned completely his design activity. He became the general manager of Alessi. And he started uh, calling outside the designers and architects to come and to have a, co to a collaboration with Alessi. I must underline that this period, beginning 50s, may be considered as the uh, historic start of the phenomenon of the Italian design factories. Together with my father, uh, several of his uh, in colleagues, entrepreneurs, they felt the need to give a stronger character to their production, not only anymore, only the production costs, which were not that, big, that high, not only the quality of the production, the material quality of the production, but also some aesthetical uh, qualities. And it was very interesting because they crossed with a similar phenomenon of a new generation of very extremely talented Italian architects and designers, also very young. People like the brothers Castiglioni, Marco Zanuso, Caccia Dominioni, Magistretti, Gaia Ulenti, and so on. And so started the, the story of Italian design. Some very early products of the 50s. This is only a prototype of Anselmo Vitale, or the cocktail shaker by Massoni and Mazzari, which is in production also today. Then I jump to the 70s and to, to this guy born in a teapot which was me, myself, <laughs> meaning that my destiny was clear since the beginning. I had to start working in the company. I, my father gave me also the possibility to run some design researches for the company. The, my very first design uh, research was called Alessi Dapre. The idea of Alessi Dapre was to use my machines instead of producing trays of balls, ice buckets, coffee makers, and so on, to use my, my machines in order to produce real art objects. I mean uh, uh, sculptures, conceived not anymore by designers or architects, but by real actual sculptors. Um, the proper name for this kind of object was, is art multiples, meaning original art pieces produced by the machines. So I did uh, and presented, at least my idea was to present them to the market at a very reasonable price. I mean, uh, a ball like Gusho, uh, an art multiple like Gusho uh, numero uno of Joe Pomodoro at a price of a normal ball. Um, the operation was presented to the market in 1971. In a few months, it showed to be clearly a big fiasco, a complete flop, <laughs> meaning that the customers, my customers showed no interest in my poor art multiples. So that my father stopped me to continue with the collection. I actually had several other sculptors working with me, for me. For example, the the Spanish maestro, Salvador Dali. Salvador Dali, Salvador Dali with the prototype of his art multiple and the drawing of Dali. The name of his project for Alessi was, uh, was okay. Objet inutile vase sur un problème de topologie négative. <laughs> He was joking, 
probably, but I was too young to understand. So, so respectful towards the big maestro. Here, the, my, the, the Spanish maestro shows, explains to the very young Alberto the importance of hooks. Actually, part of the Lee multiple was a comb, uh, gold plated, and to every single tooth of the tomb, of the comb, was welded an enormous, a, a giant uh, um, uh, stainless steel hook for the fish to the salmon. Uh, as I said, my father stopped me, so I couldn't <laughs> continue with the project of Salvador Dali, but he, my father was not able to stop me before I bought about 50,000 of these uh, stainless steel hooks. <laughs> That it was very difficult to find. I found at the end through a producer in Oslo, Norway. We still carry in our stock the 50,000 hooks. <laughs> because then, after Dali, I have worked with several hundred of designers, but no one of them was able to find a possible idea to recycle or reuse the hooks. Then, luckily, for my father, during the 70s, I have been, uh, I had the possibility to work with some of the most interesting Italian design maestros. They, these people I show you, became extremely important for Alessi, not only because they have designed a very important commercial success for the business, but more than that, because, they, because of their personality, they were able to leave an, a, a strong imprint within the overall practices of the company. They succeed in a period of almost uh, 20 years to modify the uh, identity itself of the company, as I will try to explain to you. Also, for me personally, they were actually my maestros. First of them being Ettore Sozzas. The second, Richard Sapper. Sapper is actually a German designer, but he is living and working in Milano since the 50s, so he, has, he is, has to be considered as part of the history of Italian design. Richard designed our first espresso maker in 79, and our first water kettle. This water kettle has a nice story which may be helpful to explain a bit to you the practice of the uh, Italian design factories. So, the idea of Sapper was to, okay, <laughs> he told me, I will design you a very beautiful kettle, but that's not enough to me, to him. I want to design a kettle multisensorial, meaning able to appeal to several different human senses. In particular, he wanted the cat, his kettle being able to produce a melody when the water was boiling, meaning instead of the uh, bad noise that usual kettles on the market produce when the water boils, he wanted a melody. After one, we worked for one and a half year, and then my technicians were not able to find the technical solution in order to produce the melody. By the way, Sapper wanted also a melody a speci special melody remembering him, his uh, childhood. He was a child in a village near Stuttgart. There was a river, and there was a steamboat passing uh, on the river and uh, producing this uh, melody Sapper wanted us, uh, being able to reproduce. So as I said, I was obliged to put to the side to abandon the project until almost one year later, one of Sapper's sisters, living in Germany, uh, uh, discovered uh, an artisan, a craftsman, producing a chorist. Now, I don't know if you know what a chorist is. I have one always with me. A chorist is a small pipe in metal with another metal part inside in, uh, in a gold-plated brass, and it was conceived to produce the perfect note, musical note, la, in order to be used to tune musical instruments. 
So to be short, after, <laughs> after long uh, discussion with these German craftsmen, you know Germans are a bit hard to convince to change their uh, <laughs> habits, we convinced him to produce two special versions of the chorist, not anymore in La, but in note Mi and the Si. These chorists are put into the pipes of the chorist. And actually, when the water boils, they do produce a melody, which is not exactly the melody of the childhood of supper. But at the end, he accepted the compromise. <laughs> and so we could start again with the product, with the project. It became a very big success, still in production. I, at this point, I cannot stand. I need to make you a demonstration. I brought with me the weasel. That's to El Fischietto. This is the weasel. And uh, hello to uh, me. Uh, si. And of course, they play together when the water boils. I'm, that, that's, uh, that's the history of supper kettle. By the way, the supper kettle has also, I must admit, some minor functional problems. <laughs> uh, the, the matter is that since the chorists were not conceived for that use, it may be, may happen that depending from the quality of the water that you are using, after a while, some months, they tend to oxidize, and so they do not uh, work anymore. <laughs> uh, of course, the, the material, let's say, the materialistic function of boiling the water is still there. But not the most important function, according to Sapper and to me, which is the poetic function of producing the melody. Tapper was also the designer of the most complex design, research, the longest design research I've done by using also as consultant some of the most interesting European cooks in the 70s, beginning 50s. Sapper has a rhythm of uh, one project every five years, being very lazy as a designer. <laughs> so we know that every five years we will receive a project that usually is a good project, but very lazy. The third maestro is Achille Castiglioni. Achille Castiglioni has designed our first cutlery called the Dry, 80, in production since 82. And uh, then his family of tabletop objects. The fourth maestro, we are still in the 70s, is Alessandro Mendini. Alessandro Mendini is actually not only a designer designing objects for Alessi, he is also our design historian and my main, uh, let's say, cultural consultant. He is also the designer of the more uh, hazardous project of Alessi, like in the case of the Alessophone. The Alessophone is a new saxophone designed by Mendini with the help of two specialists in the sax, of course. It is completely made by hand. It is by far the most expensive saxophone on the market. <laughs> Maybe we produce eight per year. But it seems it is very good for, uh, for uh, um, jazz music. Then Anna G. Alessandro Mendini is, has always been proud, very proud of the fact of being considered a designer designing things that do not sell. <laughs> Meaning his taste being too sophisticated for us normal public, <laughs> what is very true, except that uh, almost 15 years ago he made the mistake of his life without help creating energy, which became uh, 
and a lessy bestseller for more than 20, for 20 years almost now. Anna G is a corkscrew. Is also the portrait of uh, Alessandro's young fiancé of that decade. <laughs> and uh, since, uh, ten, since a few years, she has a companion, Sandro M. Is also, uh, Sandro is also a corkscrew. It comes in different var variations, <laughs> in limited edition. <laughs> Then we are into the 80s. Uh, here it became clear to me that there were uh, two different ideas, two different interpretations of industrial design. On one side, there was the vision of uh, myself, of the Italian design factories. On the other side, there was the interpretation of, uh, so to say, mass production industry. Mass production industry, they do understand design may be important, but they give to design, to industrial design, a kind of inferior position, like one of the several tools for technology or for marketing. This is not the vision of Italian design factories. We do believe design is a new form of contemporary art and poetry. This is the reason why we put design at the very top of our companies and why design influences all our practices. Uh, every 10 years I am brought to meet and to design with almost 100 new designers or architects. But then at the end of the decade and looking back to what I did, what we did, I note, I understand that this decade has been marked by only a few of them for reason still mysterious to me. So, for example, the 80s, they have been marked mainly by three personalities. The Italian designer Aldo Rossi, who was mainly an architect. He is considered the most interesting Italian architect in the second half of the past century. Ecco Aldo, Aldo's coffee makers. Aldo did also our first uh, watch. He, Rossi died in 1997. This is his last project for Alessi. It is called La Cubica. It is uh, a pot and uh, it can be considered Aldo's last homage to, you know, to the functionalist motto form follows function, being, I tell you, the ideal pot for boiling cubic tomatoes. <laughs> the second is Michael Graves. To continue reading. <laughs> I'm too tired. The second is Michael Graves. Michael became, uh, this is the very first project of Michael Graves for a list. It was a tea and coffee set made in only 99 pieces, uh, handmade in silver. Then in 85, he designed the, his kettle that, that became for many, many years number one bestseller. Also today, after two, more than 25 years, it is in the top 10 list. And around the kettle, he designed a complete family between, of objects in different materials. Here you see the only part, only the part in metal. From 85 to 95, he, Michael was our design hero. This picture introduces the third per personality of the 80s for Alessi, the French designer Philippe Stark. Now I show you my record. This was Philippe when I met him in the middle 80s, and this is Philippe today. Look, the miracles of some probably surgical <laughs> <intelligence>. <laughs> Or maybe time, time is passing, but not for everybody the same way. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so, Tark, the squeezer, Juicy Salif, 89. The project of the squeezer. This is the way uh, Stark was uh, working in the 80s. A uh, big uh, kitchen colander called uh, um, Max Le Chinois. He is uh, 
at that time famous or infamous not working water kettle, hot water. <laughs> I say, to be quick, not working. Actually, it was working, just a bit difficult to handle. <laughs> but um, uh, sometimes we receive demand from some, mainly Japanese, uh, Japanese customers to have a new production of this kettle, but we don't do. <laughs> in, in Italy, we say, uh, we say, errare humanum est, perseverare diabolicum. Stark is not only an excellent designer, he is also brilliant in creating names for his projects. This is a, a cheese grater inside, combined into a cheese container. One of the holes is the spoon, and the name of this object is Mr. Mu Mu. Request to start. Some, quickly, some other projects of the 80s. From Napoli, very south of Italy, the, the, the project of the Napoletana, which was uh, another system, not the espresso, to make in Italy coffee after the war, before the war. Or uh, Bob Venturi. Bob has designed a tray, a cuckoo clock. Or Andrea Branzi from Milano. Of Frank Gehry, designed a kettle in 1991 called the Pito, or the Swiss architect Mario Botta, or Norman Foster, Trey. Ah, this is a, th I can save you this part of theory, <laughs> which is maybe too much for tonight. This is only to say that, OK, in our opinion, the, the, the reason why object, objects exist cannot, cannot be only the functional value. Of course, the functional value in functional objects must be there. But it is not the only reason why objects exist. There is also the status value or a style value. And there is also, in my opinion, the poetic value, meaning, I mean, there is an enormous need for art and poetry in our society, and this need of art and poetry is not anymore fulfilled only by the classic fruition methods, meaning I go to museum for art or to books for poetry. People would like to be surrounded by uh, poetic values all his daily life. All these values together, they can be uh, the raison d'etre of objects. Uh, working with this kind of designers and architects, I also understood step by step that Alessi, uh, to, to, as well as my colleagues of the other design factories, was in a way changing its identity. From being just a more or less normal industrial company using the best Italian designers to design their products into a different identity, which was, is to be a kind of industrial research laboratory, industrial research workshop into the area of applied arts or design. And I also understood that our actual role was to be mediators. We practice an endless mediation between, on one hand, the best expressions of creativity in product design from all over <coughs> the world. And on the other hand, we mediate this creativity. We make real this creativity in order to match with final customer's dreams or imaginary. Since we do believe our um, design is a new form of art and poetry. That means we believe that our activity has the nature of being a kind of art mediators. So I know I'm using completely different tools, but at the end, my activity is very similar as if I was, I don't know, a gallery, an art gallery owner, or a museum director, or maybe even a filmmaker. In that, 
actually, which is, believe me, the main characteristic of Italian design factories today, but in that, we didn't, we didn't invent anything new. At the contrary, we can be seen, the Italian design factories, as the last, at the moment, today, the last hairs of a, the last ring of, of a much longer chain, starting in the middle 1800 in England with the arts and craft movement, John Ruskin and William Morris. Another ring being the Deutsche Werkbund, founded in Germany by Hermann Mutesius, or beginning 1900, the Wiener Werkstätte with Josef Hoffmann, uh, Colum Moser, Dagobert Peche, and others. Or the Glasgow Art School by Charles <coughs> Rennie Mackintosh, or the Bauhaus, the German Bauhaus in the 20s with Walter Gropius <coughs> and later on Miss van der Rohe. Or the Kreinbock Academy of Art with Elias Saarinen and these kind of people that you well know. I think, as you may read, the Italian design factories may be considered as last spiritual hairs of these intellectual and creative movements, all of which shared a common trend in that they were generally oriented toward the production of objects, of course, but also bore the imprint of a powerful cultural and intellectual influence. I, this I already said. <laughs> Very quickly, some, some of our colleagues of the Italian design factories, Gio uh, Ponti for Cassina, the Superleggera Chair 57, of Zanus and Sapper, the TV set for Brion Vega in the 60s, the Pass d'Urbino Lomazzi for Poltronova, or Tizio Land for Artemide, or Achille Castiglioni for e Pier Giacomo for Zanotta, or again Castiglioni and Pio Manzu for Floss, Vico Magistretti for Artemide, Bruno Munari for Danese, or some examples of the radical design in Italy during the 80s, Ettore Sozzas for Memphis, Andrea Branzi and Alessandro Mendini for Alchimia. Prototypes. Of course, uh, developing so many projects every, every year, we have an enormous activity of production of new prototypes. Here I show you some of these prototypes, which are kept then in the Alessi Museum. This is not a prototype. The prototype, <laughs> the, the real product is the, the bracelet. This is the Alessi Mobile. It was the idea of producing a, a real car, a project done with Philip Starr 20 years ago. This is another example of the practices of uh, the Italian design factories. The project was done by another famous Italian maestro, Enzo Mari. Enzo Mari was insisting with me that Alessi you know, should prove its uh, green sensibility by producing a vase made with recycled plastic bottles. So we tried to develop the idea, but at the end, at the end, uh, the, uh, to, to collect the, bot the already used bottles, to wash, to clean, to dry, to cut according to the drawings of Enzo Mari, instructions of Enzo Mari, to put in a nice box, at the end, the perceived value was not enough to cover the production cost, alas. So it was hard, but I succeed in convincing Enzo Mari that for this project, the only possibility was that the real product should be, here you see a prototype, the real product should be only 
to produce the uh, instruction booklet. The instruction booklet became a product for Alessio for more than 10 years. It was offered at a very low retail price. I have it here. Very nice graphic design. Handmade drawings by the maestro. Uh, it is very easy for you to self-produce. Uh, you only need to buy the booklet, and you can produce yourself the a very nice vase. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I, into the to, together with the booklet, it comes a nice big a big uh, label. So that once you have finished your self-production, you can attach the label to your creation, <laughs> and it will prove that it is an original Alessi product <laughs> designed by the famous maestro Mari. OK. Today, me too, I can laugh. But I tell you, it's sometimes hard to deal with this kind of people. Not, <laughs> not, not that easy. But this is part of the mediation skills that we are supposed to have as an Italian design factory. <laughs> I don't know at what time I am supposed to stop. You're fine. Sorry? You're OK. You're For how long? Uh, 25 minutes. Yeah. 25 minutes. 25. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I jumped over some decades. <laughs> this is a map by Mendini at the 90s. 90s meant for Alessi um, opening to young designers and to a different material, mainly plastic. It was the decade of the ludic, so-called so ludic language. King Kong, Giovannoni, and Venturini were the most talented between these young designers. They have created first the Girotondo collection, and then a series of plastic objects. Gino Zucchino is a sugar sifter. A fruit Mama is a, a fruit holder. The cat is a cat of a friend of mine. <laughs> uh, nat Natty the Cracker is a nutcracker. Uh, this is a gas lighter. This is a, for pet. This is a new air covering a new area of the house, which was new for Alessi. <laughs> this, unfortunately, is not an Alessi product. It was a, it is a salt cellar created by the scout, Italian sculptor Benvenuto Cellini, 1500. It is here just to prove to show that uh, this anthropomorphic <laughs> approach was not invented by young Italian designers. <laughs> 90s actually have another pole, completely radically different, which was the neo -minim mainly represented by the neo-minimalism of, of the British designer Jasper Morrison. Jasper is building his uh, minimalist collection within the Alessi catalog since then. Echo, I'm sorry, I have to go quick. Please. We are still in the 90s. The new millennium. The new millennium uh, started with uh, an important for Alessio research into the area of architecture. In Italian design, design has a lot to do with architecture. All, all, all along our history, all Italian design, important designers were first architects, then doing industrial design too. This is the reason why periodically we organize a research into the world of architecture, offering, inviting some architects to try to design some utilitarian objects. In this case, we invited 23 international architects, asking to each of them to design a tea and coffee set. The tea and coffee set was then produced in 99 pieces. This operation, at the end, 
made us understood, understanding that uh, between these 23 architects, there were maybe seven, eight able to express themselves and willing to express themselves also into the area of industrial design. And so we started with them, ser serious, these are also serious, but let's say project for mass production. All what you see here are the limited production. And all are tea and coffee sets. Uh, the title of the decade was probably the most appropriate was eclecticism, meaning so many trends are living together. These are some of the projects for mass production which were designed by these eight um, architects selected between the 23, Toyo Ito, uh, Sejima, Fuxas, Vilar, uh, Vilarez. Zadid, the future system, David Chipperfield, Peter, Peter Zunto is a Swiss, Swiss architect. The Campanas are Brazilian designers. This is Stefano Giovannoni. We are still in this past decade. Again, <laughs> Benvenuto Cellini is obsessing me. <laughs> Sorry, I, just, I go quickly because I want to, go, to arrive to, the, to these years. Collaboration with other companies. Companies means that uh, we have also a part of a list which is devoted to, to organize collaboration with other companies. We take care of the design management, the other companies, they do the, the engineering and the production. So we, be, uh, we have built a collection of watches, of uh, telephones, of uh, tiles, uh, car design with Fiat, Textile, the bathroom, two projects into the bathroom area. But this, all these productions are mainly for Europe. Pants with Mitsubishi. This is Oggetti e Progetti was the title of the exhibition that started in Munich in May and uh, which is now in Philadelphia with the, with the name, with the title uh, Ethic and Radical. I show you some of the pictures of this exhibition in Germany. This was the map created by Alessandro Mendini. The purpose of this exhibition was to try instead of waiting that the decade is at the end in order to give it a title, to try to give the title in advance, which was a very difficult uh, uh, trial. And the idea of Mendini and myself was to give as a title, where is it? Eccoli qui. Ethic and radical. By ethic and radical, we ethic or ethical and radical, the idea is that we see the next decade, these next years, as a combination of two very opposite poles. On one side, the trial to become more ethical, and by ethical, in the Alessi case, we mean to try to go towards a kind of new simplicity. And on the other side, on the other pole, to be more radical means to be even more free towards the expressiveness of our designers. Not to give them 
and any limits. I know these two poles are very difficult to be kept together, but this is another Italian characteristic. Uh, some of the designers that uh, are contributing to create the new landscape for these next years, the French brothers Burulek, the Dutch designer Wander, the Japanese Naoto Fukazawa, the French designer Pauline Del Tour. Pauline has created a very simple uh, collection of wire, metal wire baskets. The Burulek uh, complete table service in porcelain, um, glass, uh, cutlery, and metal. Now to Fukazawa, a new collection of pots and pans. Marti Gixche is a Spanish designer. The Campanas, already seen. Two uh, Finnish designers, Christina Lassus and Harry Koskinen or the Italian designer Mario Trimarchi. Or on the other pole, the, the, the radical, the a special collection of limited edition of Anna G made in precious metals and precious stones, also diamonds. They say also you from this Martin Heidegger statement. This is easier to understand. Alessia Tamarchand de Bonheur is a said motto of Philip Stark. The borderline theory. Here we are at the end of my speech. That I, in, I have to tell you something about the borderline theory. The borderline theory tries to explain the destiny of a company like Alessi. It was created in order to better explain to my, my brothers and cousins, uncles and so on, <laughs> the story of Alessi. And so it says, what the line theory says, that the destiny of a, and the nature, the very nature of a company like, like Alessi and our colleagues of the Italian design factories is that we are destined to live and act very close to a borderline. A borderline which is dividing the area of possible from the area of not possible. The area of possible being represented by new projects that people, final customers, will be ready to understand, uh, to wish, maybe to love and to buy. And the area of not possible being instead represented by new projects that people will not understand, will not be able to understand and so not to buy. Uh, the problem is that this borderline is not clearly marked. You cannot see with your eyes. <laughs> and by sure, you cannot understand, you cannot feel it with the marketing research, by sure. You can only feel with some qualities which are, at the same time, very human qualities, but very neglected by industrial culture today. I mean, making use of your own sensibility, of your own intuition, and to accept to run a bit more risk. If you do that, then you can more or less understand where the borderline is. Having, so it is very risky, the destiny of living and working uh, very close to the borderline. Having understood this, what normal uh, mass production companies do. They try to work as far as possible from the borderline. By doing that, they do not run the risk of falling into the not possible area. But on the other hand, they are all producing step by step the same product, the same car, the same TV set, the same fridge, industrial product. They are becoming more and more homogeneous and boring and unpoetical. If instead you are, you are able to work very close to the borderline without falling, or without falling too many times into the not possible, <laughs> then you may succeed in creating kind of micro markets, very beneficial for your company because you really do innovation. And also, even most important, you can give as an industrial company a good, in my opinion, the good kind of contribution 
to the development of the present stage of our consumer society. The formula. The formula, I'm, I'm afraid I have no time to explain to you, just to say <laughs> that it is a very important tool for our practice. The formula is a mathematic model that I, we use in order to understand when we have a new prototype, let's say, in front of us. With the use of the formula, we will understand very clearly which could be the future life of this project if we decide <coughs> to go for production. It is based on four parameters. The two central parameters are SMI and communication. The two peripheral parameters are function and price. This is the area, the basic uh, standard area for, for Alessi. These are some examples of uh, scores for the Michael Grafty kettle, for the Philip Starty kettle. Sometimes we have, you see, some perverse in function of, of the squeezer. This is the uh, an earlier picture of the the next generation of the early little Alesis that uh, that uh, will probably come. I I am sure I forgot something. I don't remember <laughs> what. I think I am at the end. Bill. You are at the end. Yes, that was I, great. I guess. I'd just like to start with a little question of yes. my own. Um, <laughs> very musically introduced, don't you think? And um, yeah, I, um, when I studied industrial design in London in the early 60s, uh, my thesis was cutlery design. Um, and I was always searching for the perfect spoon. And I thought the perfect spoon was one that I already had, which was a Georgian spoon. Uh, that was very delicate in silver, had lovely balance, beautiful shape, and when you put it into your mouth, you just had that feeling that it belonged, inserting something delicious into that orifice. Um, and I thought that until I saw the Alessi design by Etri Sotsas. And that was a much more perfect spoon. And the reason it was so perfect was that it was so three-dimensional. So not only did it have the balance where the front and the back were perfectly balanced, and a delicious shape for the spoon itself. It also had this handle, which was completely three-dimensional, rather than being flat in the way that most cutlery is. So I just wondered if you wouldn't mind telling me a little bit more about the story of how that design came into yeah, being. The Nuovo Milano was the design of Ettore Sozzas. Uh, it was our second cutlery design in production. It was introduced, in, I think, in 86, after more than five years of work and of discussions. I remember so well Hector and Sotsas fighting, discussing with my technicians. He wanted all the curves all rounded, all the corners rounded and the different thicknesses in the, uh, along the handle. And uh, there was a point where I felt, I thought probably we will not uh, succeed in uh, going to the end with this project, because he was insisting that much on the rounding uh, uh, effect. But then, uh, sometimes it goes like that. You never know when you start if you will be able to go to the end with the project, because uh, on the other side, you know, designer, their role is to push to the transgression. And this is another very important characteristic in Italian design. We, we are built, we are asked to, to go to the borderline, to, so to transgress to the rules, be it uh, technical, like the case of Ettore. Sometimes they are aesthetical transgression, sometimes marketing transgressions. So the borderline here is, is not so much getting drugs from Mexico, it's about taking risks about design. Yes. <laughs> Let's have some questions or comments. My name is Alex Holt-Cohan, and I was just wondering, since I saw a lot of your designs up until 
about the 90s. What um, is your feeling on color throughout de industrial design? Because I noticed that you didn't use much of fabricated color other than places where it would be inherent, like in plastic. I didn't get the question. The use of color. And so he's saying that a lot of the color that you find in your earlier work was more the natural materials of metal and so on, the colors of metal. And then in the plastics, it also molded in. So I think he's asking about color used more as a applique or secondary application like paint or decoration. Would that be correct? Yeah. Well, actually, the decision to go to plastic was the result of the of our designers insisting that much at the end of the 80s because Alessi, in a way, was obliging them to be limited in their expression possibilities to the technology of cold forming metal, which is a very limiting technology. Instead, there was this new generation of Itali mainly Italian designers, young Italian designers, they were uh, willing to express themselves with a completely different material, actually with plastic, um, for several reasons. One was that plastic is uh, permits to the designer to express, to work very much more within the three-dimensional forms. And the other reason was uh, the translucency and the possibility of using several, of using colors. So the purpose, one of the reasons to move to plastic was precisely the demand of our designers to be able and free to use different, uh, several different colors. So it came uh, very, in a way, spontaneously, giving freedom to designers the use of colors. I see one here. Hey, my name is Mr. Jacob. Um, I recently saw that Alessia also launched a computer, and you haven't mentioned that. And I was wondering if you see it as an experiment, because it seems like a big step in comparison to all the other work you did before. It's more like traditional craft-oriented. I don't know what would be just interesting to hear. The computer, like, is, computer is not yet to the market. It should be to the market uh, in one or two weeks. Uh, it, in a way, it was a casualty. We were asked by an Italian company to have uh, one of these collaborations, and uh, with the object, the matter was a computer, so we did. Why not? Because I, I'm very curious to meet uh, a different um, technology or different uh, product typologies, even if I'm not that uh, interested in electronics, I must say. I think that the electronics is uh, today still too much influenced by the technical development to give the proper attention to good design. So it is very difficult to work in electronics. Also, the life of product is so short. It, uh, it really confuses me. But when we receive, <laughs> when we receive a proposal like this, uh, we usually say, why not? It is it's always uh, stimulating to meet a, a very different world. Not in the States, she says. No. Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, your products by Mendini and Giovannoni and Miriam Miri, they have a very obvious um, narrative. They are very anthropomorphized. But I was wondering if you could maybe um, talk about the narrative and the poetics of your simpler designs, like by Jasper Morrison, or the latest designs that you were just showing us. So I think it might be about the kind of relationship between the new minimalism, which Jasper Morrison and Naoto Fukusawa represent, and comparison with the earlier designs, perhaps more the uh, Weniger Arpe Besser um, of uh, Dieter Rams or some of your other designers who are closer to minimalism. Is there a relationship between the first round of minimalism and this current approach towards the ethical um, uh, in a way, yes, it is a continuation of the same, more or less, of the same approach, the search for a kind of new simplicity. Yes, it is clearly, there is clearly a common um, link between the work of uh, Jasper Morrison, uh, Piero Lissoni, 
and these new people. In terms of, uh, of differences uh, between the language, uh, uh, the ludic language of Giovannoni, Miriam Miri, even Alessandro Mendini, they are so different that I don't need to explain. Well, that was just, just different approaches. That was not my, my question. My question was... More about the narrative. Talking about the poetry in design, and I was wondering how do you explain the poetry in these very minimalist uh, designs, like by Peter Rounds or by Jasper Morrison or by any of the young designers? I'll give you my explanation while he's thinking about it. <laughs> try, try to be. No, I, I, I'm sorry, my English is too primitive to go deep with the author. Let, let's say what he says. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was lucky enough to work with uh, Naoto Fukusawa for many decades because I hired him first from Seiko Epson and he came to my San Francisco office and then uh, started our Tokyo office and then made his own company later. And one of the things that I really loved about his approach was that he has this incredible balance in terms of his narrative between uh, the traditional aesthetic of Japanese um, uh, cu culture and the new aesthetic of this new minimalism. And one of the things he talks about is what he calls hari. And hari is a tension. And, and it's the attempt to create the balance between the tension, between those two things, expressionism and minimalism, that caused the uh, uh, arrival of hari. I believe that's very similar to the borderline, um, except it's about um, a borderline that's within the aesthetic um, conversation as opposed to the total conversation. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what about the narrative? I mean, the storytelling part. She asked first about the narrative, and I didn't really, you know. The narrative uh, side is much more evident when you take the ludic language, the use of the metaphors and all that. But at the end, a metaphor is always there in a design. Even if you take, uh, I don't know, Richard Sapper, coffee maker, uh, there is a metaphor there of a rocket. Of course, the language of Richard Sapp is completely different from the language of uh, Stefano Giovannoni. Uh, see. This one, it's two up the front. Oh, this one, man. Eh? Oh, it's working now. Um, I'm Ryan Nussbacher, and it's interesting that we have uh, Bill Moggridge here and uh, Albert Olesi, because Bill, as we all know, wrote a very important book about uh, interaction design, which is largely these days, um, you know, uh, very computerized sort of interface thing. And on your side, you're more about the poetry of the physical object. So what the question can, can, can kind of go to both of you, but where do you see that sort of coming together? I mean, a lot of new electronics today and a lot of the sort of the bigger design firms, you know, here in the States are all about electronics, 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 and, you know, interfaces at all the time. But in essentially what I keep seeing is a lot of people making cubes or very, very close similar objects to like the iPhone or the, or the iPod. Um, where do you see any companies sort of making a better, a better link between what is good as far as digital interaction and also physical human interaction with an object. Your time. I don't understand the question. Well, I think it's really about the relationship between um, the digital design and the physical design um, and the computer human interaction, which is the thing that defi defines a lot of the software that we see and how that relates to the human to object interaction. Well, in our case, as I said, we have a little to do with, the, with these uh, new technologies, but very, very little. I must say that also one characteristic of uh, the work that I, that I do is to deal with um, objects, I mean typologies of objects, which are at the very end of their uh, evolution parable. How old uh, is, a, is a pot or a bowl or even a glass or a plate? Thousand years old. It means that there were uh, a few hundreds of designers, anonymous designers, working to bring this te 
evolution of this typology to the point that we know today. Uh, it means that in our world of objects, uh, uh, modifications are very little. And uh, for example, that uh, at the end, if you ask me, at the end of this, of this new century, we will very probably eat uh, in a porcelain dish, which will be very similar to the forms of the dish that we have today. Just to say how old is the kind of work I'm doing. Instead, if I take a more technological item, not to say an iPhone, but even an airplane, it's like a little baby compared to a ball. So we can expect from the design of an airplane a much bigger evolution compared to the design of a plate, of a fork even. A typology. I'm not against uh, the, the, the design for electronics, but what I just tried to explain is that there is this uh, approach which is very typical of the Italian design factories and that comes from the areas of furniture, lighting and uh, objects, which is, uh, I, try to, I try to explain to you, and it is very typical uh, of Italy today. There are also some other companies doing a very similar job, but not as a group of companies, mainly as individuals. For example, take the German, the German comp furniture company Vitra, or the Finnish group uh, Itala. They do an excellent job, and more or less with the same approach and the same practices. But this is a very specific story for the field uh, of this kind of objects. I could add a comment on the um, relationship to the electronics there, I think, in that if you look at um, um, the narrative again, and you look at all so many of the designs that you showed us this evening throughout your career, the, the narrative or the metaphor is a very strong statement, so that there's something really engaging and amusing and poetic about that metaphor or story that the object itself is, is saying. But if you look at, say, Johnny Ives' work at Apple, you find these very neutral physical designs uh, for the iPad or the iPhone or the uh, laptop because a lot of that metaphor and, and liveliness is actually in the behavior of the software. So perhaps the new modernism is partly a reflection of this mixture of the technology between the live animation that happens on the screen behaviors uh, needs a recessive frame in order to not be interfered with. Whereas if you look at a traditional object, to have a lovely story about a kettle that looks like a rocket is actually a great thing. Stark uh, Star tried to, to have a different approach with electronics when he worked in the 90s for, for Thompson. But apparently not that successful, also in terms of design uh, quality. Yeah, but he but never really took on the software, I think yeah. that was the problem. Yeah. Anyway, I see a, a, a question here, or a comment. Hi, um, hello. <laughs> um, I'm Carla Diana, and I'm a designer here in New York at a firm called Smart Design. And um, I noticed that a lot of the products are very playful and um, have an element of delight, but we don't see actually toys for children. They're all meant for adults and they're very adult products and very sophisticated in, in that adult way. But I was wondering if you have ever done toys for, toys for children, products meant for children. Yes, we did some projects uh, for toys. I'd like so much to be able to develop new toys but I must admit it is much more difficult to do toys for real toys for a child. 
Instead, for, for adults, it is easier, <laughs> much easier. I mean, as a, I also feel less responsibility working with adults. Doing a toy for a child means that you have a responsibility, important responsibility. We did some project, but at, until now, not uh, in production. But I wish I could be able. Hi, I'm an art consultant here in New York City, and I was just wondering, I've seen uh, Vito Anconci and Ron Arat did a lot of uh, the design, but use a lot of uh, the architect design your product, but is there any other artist that you're influenced? If so, would you be able to do some kind of limited edition product with artists? Do you have anything, anybody in your mind? Um. Apart the collection of art multiples that I showed you at the very beginning of my career. The disaster. The disaster. <laughs> I just introduced a new collection, a new disaster. <laughs> a new collection of art multiples, only five projects in a limited edition in this case. And apart from this, sometimes it happened in our history to, to deal with some artists, but mainly for decoration, for B-dimensional decoration. For example, with Alessandro Mendini, we did, beginning 90s, a research about the theme of the vase, and we asked 100 people, most of them artists, to design the skin of the vase, for in this case. Whether I must, uh, I think that if we go for functional objects, three-dimensional, it is not a matter for, a, for, a, for an artist. We need the professionalism of a designer or of an architect, at least in my experience. This one here. Hi. Hi, my name is Brian. And uh, I'm an industrial designer here in New York City. And I'm wondering, I'm assuming that a lot of desi young designers are going to um, present themselves in front of you. They want to be part of your design designers list for um, you know creating a next generations of products. I'm wondering what's your criteria of looking at into these 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 new designers. What kind of elements? What what do you look for in these new designers these days? If you understand my, my question, or can you hear my question? Well, what I'm looking for. Um, the aim is that, uh, um, for example, when we started with this young design in the 90s, this was a good example in our history. I felt the need to open the doors of Alessi also to new design, not only to the star design, star system, big maestros. Uh, also because I was convinced that uh, um, let's say, good design is a good uh, representation of our times. And a good designer has to, has to be able to smell the spirit of the times where he is working. And this cannot be, I was thinking, represented as by the same people who already felt the, the spirit of the 50s, of the 60s, of the 70s, of the 80s. I knew they will, they will continue during the 90s and 2000s, but I also thought that we should look for more fresh uh, feelings. So what, I am, so what I am looking into a design for a new designer is uh, try to understand whether he will be able to, one, uh, feel the spirit, smell the spirit, the true spirit of the times, and two, being able to represent it under a new uh, expression, a new form. Thank you. Anyone else there? There's one down the front here. Going once. Coming, the microphone's right here. You said that it was the designer's job to push you, but I wonder um, how often you have to abandon a project just because it simply can't be done. How often do you just finally say, sorry, we can't do it? Uh, 
maybe I should do more often. <laughs> uh, now, because sometimes I'm, I accept to be pushed to push too much. But sometimes it may happen, yes, but very rarely. Um, uh, for example, we introduce every year 60 to 70 new projects. These new projects, they have a, they have a cycle of preparation of around two years. And they come from a selection of maybe 10 times. So 60 to 70 come from 600, 700 projects. So that means that the selection is done, usually not that much because we do not accept to be pushed, but because of the quality of the project. If the quality is not enough, then there is no way to be pushed. But if the quality is really, we feel the quality is really good, then maybe we accept we are too weak. I was interested I to compare that with Silicon Valley because you know I've lived in Silicon Valley for the last 31 years. And there you, you have this flow of new start companies, um, which are funded by venture capital. But they come out usually from technology first, looking for design and customer and, and money. Um, and the, and the, the normal statistic there is about 2% success rate. You expect about 2% of those companies to survive to the point where they either go public or they're sold. Mm. And you're saying more like 10%, are you? One, t 70 and 700? So it's yes. more like 10%. That's a tremendously high success rate, even better than the valley. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's a good news. I see a hand up there. Hi. Uh, I'm David Nosenschuk. I'm an architect and a designer and very interested in lights and objects. And I know Italian, Italy has a great history of designing lights. And just curious if you've ever considered what a light out of your company would mean and then also how to possibly fuse the idea of a light and the objects that you already create. So if a spoon or a dish or a salt and pepper shaker or a glass could also be a a light, you know, is that, have you ever considered how a light could be part of your collection? Well, yes, because in a way, as I said, the furniture and lighting are the boundaries of my, of my original field. So it is clear that uh, we periodically think to these uh, other areas, but very different from my original because the technology is completely different. Materials are very often different. But yes, I am thinking to, to lighting very much. I just, uh, hello? Yes. <laughs> I, I just want to follow up on a question that was asked previously. You said you work with about 600 projects a year of which 50 to 70 become real. But of those 50 to 70, how many of those go into mass production? And of those that go into mass production, how many of those stay uh, as a viable uh, line for more than several years? Well, actually, almost all, almost all what we produce is uh, a regular product. I wouldn't call mass production, but a regular production, meaning they are produced in uh, quantities of some, at least some thousand pieces a year. A few, at least a few thousand pieces a year. Um, maybe one or two projects over the 60 or 70, they are what we call the limited editions, but no more. The ever no more. So, for example, this year we have introduced this uh, precious energy corkscrew, which is one pro we consider it one project over 60 or 70. This was a limited production. Uh, so. And then when you have a, a, a huge success like um, Michael Graves' tea kettle with the bird, how many of those have you made? 100,000. 100,000. That's a lot more. But uh, they, are, uh, they are produced the same way of the average production of, you thousand, of a few thousand pieces. It is not that we have a line of mass production separated from the line for normal production. 
it is done, it is manufactured the same way. Yeah. Should we sell a few thousand or one hundred thousand? Then how long they, they stay in our catalog? Usually they have a very long life. Also because of this flexibility which uh, permits us to produce a project even if we sell a few thousand pieces a year. This permits us to keep project in, in the catalog for, uh, let's say, I may say the average for metal is 25, uh, 30 years. Well, thank you for your wonderful catalogue and thank you for everything from a few to a hundred thousand and thank you for being so ethical and so radical. <laughs> <laughs>